Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series. We cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, you can always watch um, our archives later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of the day show where you can access those archives. Both our live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries and we provide services to all types of libraries in our state. So you will find things on our show and in our archives for publics, academics, K-12s, corrections, museums, any type of archives. Uh, pretty much our only criteria is that it is something to do with libraries. Something um, we bring in guest speakers sometimes, talk about cool, interesting things they are doing in their libraries. We talk about services and products we offer here, <clears throat> excuse me, through the Nebraska Library Commission, um, and just any sort of resources we think may be of interest to libraries. And before we get into today's show, I want to do a brief uh, little reminder to our Nebraska libraries, for anyone here is um, here uh, from Nebraska. At the Nebraska Library Commission, we are still tracking and keeping up with information related to the COVID-19 pandemic that's going on worldwide right now. We have a link or a blog post here that's pinned to the top of our main website that will bring you to where we um, have links to different resources. We have a list that we've got ongoing and you can see that at the top of here of any, when libraries were closing, special accommodations they're making when they're closing, and if they are in the midst of working on reopening as some are. Um, if you go to our, and you can notify us if you do have any changes at your library situation here in Nebraska. There's specific some information here. Um, what about my kids and unemployment, et cetera. But if you're at a library, we've got some resources here that we are keeping up to date as new information comes out about um, what to do with closing, what to do when you're opening. Uh, the most recent big news that people may have heard is from the Realm Project, Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Their most recent report, I think it was just yesterday, came out about how long the coronavirus does last on typically typical materials that are returned to libraries. And it looks like three days is the max. So go ahead and take more look more at that. Quarantine your items for three days before you reissue them out. Um, but we keep this up to date with any new information that comes up. If you're not a Nebraska library, uh, check with your local state library or, or your own state state library or um, your state's library association, they may be sharing the same kind of resources for you in your areas as well. So um, today I'm going to switch over to you, Amanda, now so we can get your slides up. You should see the pop up for that. And I'm hoping this shows the right screen because I've got two monitors in front of me. Okay, right now it's, um, well, do present. Have you, um, have you done it for full screen to present already? Oh, I'm moving the controls for go to meeting because they're covering the present button. There you go. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Perfect. It's full screen. All right. So um, this morning with me is Amanda Sweet. Good morning, Amanda. And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And once a month, usually it's the last Wednesday of the month, uh, she comes on and talks about something techy, tech related. It's her pretty sweet tech session um, each month. So if you are a big tech um, geared person, library staff, or you want to know more about it, this would be the one to um, definitely keep an eye on. And today she's a talk about something that is definitely, I think a lot of us have been dealing with over the last few months during the pandemic, how to leverage online learning to build new skills. For many of us, it's the only way we're doing things now is online and remotely. So I think this is very timely, perfect. So I'll just hand over to you, Amanda, to uh, tell us how to do that. So I can't guarantee that I have all the answers. No one does. But this is just kind of a mapping out of what's worked for me and what's worked for the people that I worked with. So a lot of there's a ton of webinars out there about how to help teachers improve their instruction. This is actually more for helping the student improve their own skills to be able to take advantage of all the multitude of resources that teachers have already created. And 
So this is kind of a rundown of the main process that I ran through to get myself ready. And once I ran through this myself, then I started practicing it with other people to make sure that it was generalize, generalizable. So the first thing that I did was to unlearn my bad learning habits. I have a master's degree and yet I still didn't know how to learn. I had been really reliant on making sure there was someone there to tell me what I should be learning. And I realized that that's not really the greatest way to go about it because, well, it wasn't working. And so then I set about trying to find out what I actually really wanted to do and lay down a solid foundation of goals and what I wanted to get out of the learning that I was undertaking. And when I had a solid understanding of why I was doing it and what I wanted to do, it was then that I decided which resources I wanted to use and how I wanted to go about learning. And then as I was figuring out my general goal, then I built out a solid learning plan to say, this is the schedule that I'm going to follow. This is the content I'm going to use. And I'm going to put this into a spreadsheet so I can adjust this later on and know that all of the materials and activities that I'm doing are actually fitting with my learning goal. And then I, the double check your plan is actually talking to professional communities that are either online or in person to make sure that I'm not diving down a rabbit hole. Because some of this stuff, I, it's topics that I've never touched before, never seen before, and I've just done a lot of background research about them. So it never hurts to ask someone. And this is kind of a lot. So I had to set in place different ways to keep myself motivated. And that actually meant um, watching, like taking control of what I watch on Netflix, which was kind of surprising. I had to completely shift what I, the entertainment that I take in, what I read and who I surround myself with. So that was interesting. All right, so let's dive into this. So how did I unlearn my bad habits and what were they? So this is what I read through to get myself in the right mindset. Um, actually, I'm rereading this one right now, Ultra Learning. So Ultra Learning was written by Scott Young, and he also has a really awesome blog about self-learning and teaching yourself new skills. And he talks a lot about focus and how to get yourself into the mindset and stop relying on a traditional learning path. And he has some, he uses really hardcore examples of people who have like learned a full language to proficiency in three months. I, I didn't do that. Wow. But <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> And he uses other examples of like, uh, he himself didn't speak English for a solid year. He went around to, I believe, about four different countries and only spoke the native language through full immersion to teach himself new skills. And he learned, he took a solid four years of an MIT computer science course in one year. But the caveat was that he used online learning resources. And he focused not on the lectures because they weren't available online, but he used the practice sets and he set the goal for himself. And the really funny thing about that was that he got to the point where he could pass all of the exams. And then that really points, that really speaks to teaching to the test because does he have an MIT degree because he passed all the exams and finished the problem sets? It was an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I wanna just mention everyone, while we're actually looking at this slide here with all these book covers and titles, um, along with the archive um, recording of today's show, we will have a link to Amanda's slides. So um, if there is any like titles and authors and other links or anything that she mentions in here, don't worry about trying to scribble all that information down. Um, we'll have a, a link to all of this for you at, afterwards. Yeah. So ultra learning, I clearly did not take all of the, I did not follow the instructions to the letter. 
because I didn't want to shut down my entire life and do devote my everything to learning full time. So instead, I shifted Everybody over. Everybody has that um, that are lucky enough to be able to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And plus, educate like education is getting more expensive. I have a master's already, and I'm already in debt, and I could not bring myself to add more debt onto this top of that stack. And I'm betting that there are a lot of people out there that feel that pain. And that's what he talks a lot about in ultra learning. And Scott Young, he worked a lot with Cal Newport in the bottom left-hand corner, deep work. And Cal talks a lot about focus. And so does, oh, the author isn't on there, but Indistractable is near E-L, N-I-R-E-Y-A-L. And they both talk about focus and how to shift away from letting the computer rule, like rule your life and not just the computer, but other activities. And I realized that while I was trying to learn things like JavaScript and I was boning up on my instructional design and boning up on adult learning theory, you know how when you log into a course and there's all those different resources of articles down at the bottom, I started following those and I started flying down a rabbit hole. And I it felt like I was learning a lot because I was reading a lot, but I wasn't actually accomplishing very much. It was like a full sense of learning. And that was what I learned in Barbara Oakley, The Mind for Numbers. And she talks about the full sense of learning and saying, you're, it feels like you're doing a lot, but I'm sorry, honey, you're not. And that, that was, it was a bitter sting, but it was something I needed to learn. But so let's move on so we can get through the rest of these. These are some specific tools that I took out of those books to kind of put myself to rights. So even if you don't read all of that stuff, you can try these tools. And these are all clickable links. So if you access the slides after this, you can go to all these. Uh, this was actually the most helpful for me, time boxing. And so this was, I realized I was wasting a whole lot of my time. And I went to Near Al's, um, he had a session with Nebraska Product and I listened to him speak. And then I bought his book and then I tried a thing and it worked. But this is kind of an article that'll tell you how to start looking internally to find out those little internal cues that are telling you to get distracted with something else. Mine were, this is too hard to do. Um, and every time I heard a ping in my email or a ping from another notification, my attention would fracture. And then I would lose control and my, like control of my focus. So I shut off my notifications and I logged out of my email and I only check it probably two times a day now when it used to be just eternally open on my computer screen. But he has a lot of good tips in there. So either read this because it has the most vital information or grab his book. And let me go back into present. And I'll just go through the rest of these pretty quickly. Um, the I can't do it, I overcame by going through the imposter syndrome. And Krista, I think there was a session on an imposter syndrome, was that a week ago? Yes. Um, um, Maybe two? Weeks two? Ago. In a, yeah. a session two weeks ago, earlier this month, identity and imposter syndrome in library makerspaces, mm -hmm. which I mean, it talked specifically about makerspaces, but it definitely was talking about the whole imposter syndrome in general and could apply to any. Um, I should watch that. It was a good one, yeah. <laughs> uh, this article goes to Harvard Business Review, and they did an article. It's a pretty good one with some good tips. And this one is my favorite. Um, Simon Sinek, start with, start with why TED Talk. 
and this is actually probably the biggest one that helped because I had never been asked what my values were. I don't, maybe that's a common thing now in schools, but I had never been asked. I had never thought about it. But it was kind of an exercise to go through what actually matters. And I forgot to put it in here, but there was a secondary resource by Mind Tools that it's basically a choose your values thing. And it says, what are some different things that have made you really proud in life? What are some things that made you really happy? And what are some things that really resonated with you that you dug in deeply and found yourself losing time to be able to focus on them? And for me, that was kind of, I have a mild, like, try to help the world kind of thing going on here. And I think a lot of people are starting to get that. But kind of that world improvement, helping people, and education was a big one. And so that actually became my why. So this became the framework that led my instruction, that led my own self-instruction. So why am I doing this? I want to help people find out what they want to do in life. And fulfilling your dreams requires lifelong learning. The library is a great place to be for that. How am I going to do this? I will research the teams required to build complex learning environments. Then I'll find out what I do best, then build a team to accomplish the rest together. So the reason for this was I knew that I wanted to start building more learning experiences, but I also knew that there were other technology tools and other roles that would be required to do that, but I didn't know enough about how that technology was made and designed to be able to build a team or do anything with it. So I had to do that background information to find out that I was going in the right direction. And then I had to reach out to different professional groups that were already building similar learning environments, and they were already using things like machine learning and augmented reality to supplement those learning environments and then find out how those things are made. And then I would find out what my role in that process was and how I could help bring a team together that would be able to accomplish those goals. And then that team would have to be aligned with similar values, otherwise chaos would ensue, or so says Simon Sinek. And I believe him. And so the result was that I already had a, somewhat of a background in user experience design, and I know that that builds a connection between the whole learning and life. If you don't know people, you can't design a system that'll help them. And so then HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I already knew HTML and CSS, but I needed to add more JavaScript because JavaScript is what makes learning interactive. If you go to a website and you can't do anything with it, you can't interact with it, it's not really an experience. So that was the language that I needed to know to get my message across. And then adult learning theory, I already had a background in, but I needed to know more about it and I needed to learn about service learning. And service learning is more about community development and the whole helping people. And so the what is, I am a learning experience designer. I don't know who made up that name, but it's a cool one. And in general, I put people first. It's human-centered design, user experience. It all comes together. And thus, I found my Ikigai. So I don't know if you've heard about this concept before, but this also follows in with this start with your why. And there was a Pew Research did a report that said that a high percentage of people did not find fulfillment in their work or in their life. And there was recently a, they're starting to study this more. Um, if you're really interested in finding the studies that I have been looking at, you can email me. But otherwise, Peaky Guy is finding out what you're good at, what you love, 
what the world needs and what you can be paid for. So this overlapped with this. This was not intentional. I did not actually put these two together in the first place. This was not the framework that I used. I used start with why in that set of books. But then over time, I realized that they actually overlapped. They were the same thing. And it's colorful. Happy coincidence so there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but it's nice to also see, because I know some people do learn differently that, uh, you know, figuring out the first way and then looking at it that way might be better for different people. Oh, yeah. And I actually use a, to learn JavaScript, I used four different learning sources. Wow. Because I, I like each one made a different part click and each one covered different things. So if I had just used one of them, I would have a whole lot of holes in my learning. And I wound up bouncing back and forth between four major resources. And so this, some of you may have seen this already. It's a SWOT analysis. So oh, yes. it's finding your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So if you remember, I went through this and I said I already had a background in user experience. So that would be a strength but I didn't know as much as I should about it, so I had an opportunity to learn more using online resources. I already knew HTML and CSS, so that was a strength, but I my JavaScript was somewhat weak because I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't have the motivation to be able to learn the rest of it because I had other stuff I needed to do. It only really started taking off when I found this why. Otherwise, I would start a JavaScript and JavaScript course, and I would be like, why are you making me build a Twitter right now? I, I don't care. But when I was able to relate everything, every activity that I did to that learning experience, and I started saying, okay, I need to learn arrays. All right, this is going to be helpful, and I'm going to use this to start as laying a foundation for a database in the future so that when people input information into my system, I'll be able to store it and retrieve it. And now I know that I need to learn more about databases. And so the threats, um, more or less the JavaScript is gonna be boring. So the opportunity was to find different learning opportunities that made it more entertaining and actually mattered to me. And I don't use JavaScript games. I tried Grasshopper and that just, it, it was just, it felt like I wasn't getting very far. And so the other threat would be not having too many options. I kept getting scattered, starting one tutorial and then starting another tutorial and starting another tutorial. But when I found that why and I had a goal, it turned into an opportunity. So this is how I was able to build a learning plan. So I started kind of going over this when I talked about finding the why, but I realized that those tutorials that I started and stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped, I was starting to shake off the newness of a new, completely new topic. And I, in the beginning, I wanted every new thing that I learned to directly relate to what I wanted to do. But I eventually realized that sometimes the boring tutorials are necessary because you don't know if something is relevant until you've learned the basics in the first place. And when you've built that solid foundation, you're able to relate it and then reinforce that learning with self-designed practice problems. So that learning the vocabulary was I needed to, for JavaScript specifically, JavaScript has evolved over the years. So I needed to find the year at which it JavaScript reached its most recent update. And then I needed to find out what the syntax looked like before and what changed. And I needed to find out the current systems. So when I sought out different tutorials like Stack Overflow asking, I'm trying to do this, something's going wrong, 
I need some help. Then when I got the responses back or if I found an existing question on Stack Overflow, I would be able to recognize this response uses this syntax. So this is using jQuery. I haven't gotten to jQuery yet, but I will eventually. I'm going to ignore that answer. Anything with a dollar sign in it, I'm ignoring it right now. And so then I found the syntax that had the answer that I was looking for, and then I used that answer. But before this, before I had done the background research to find out what was current and what was updated, and before I shook off the newness, this was overwhelming. And I think this is why 67% of people give up on learning a new language is because there was no guide telling them to shake off the newness and no guide saying how to help with imposter syndrome. So if you don't, right now we have to learn self-guided, but there's no one telling us to do this. And it's just a touch of a problem. So then once I had all that in place, I was able to kind of keep a little checklist on a spreadsheet and say, all right, I've learned this, I practiced this, I'm probably gonna forget part of this in about maybe a couple months, I'm gonna practice it again and incorporate it into a future problem set. And so that way I didn't completely forget everything I had just learned. Because it's easy, like what we're kind of trained to do in school is when I went through my master's, went through undergrad, went through all that jazz, it was really helpful. I learned a lot and I look, learned how to look at things in a different way from different perspectives. But you also plow through content at the speed of light and you're not given the opportunity to actually soak in information, practice it and learn it because you finish a test or finish a paper and then you're just on to the next. And then you forget it. And I honestly don't know what percentage of stuff I remember from my undergrad. Geology is gone. It's rocks. There's only so much, so many brain cells and so much that can hold so much information. Yeah. And hopefully we pick the important useful ones to keep. Yeah. And that's, I remember a lot from my master's because mm -hmm. I was in, I was working in libraries at the time and I was able to practice it simultaneously and I still use it. So that's the relevance. Mm -hmm. And so I had to train myself to check in with my own learning because there's not a teacher there to do it. There's a teacher that on like Coursera, or there's, a, there's a lot of peer learning on edX and Coursera. So there's help that's sometimes available, but I audit most of them, so I don't always get that. And, but I learned how to get really in tune with whether I'm actually learning or whether it just looks like it. And then this is a long road so I had to reshape the what I read and what I pay attention to because I used to read a lot of the news and I still kind of do, but now I have designated time blocks for it. And I always leave off on some good news because otherwise I get started, I start to get mired down by the problems of the world and then I lose motivation to do a lot of this learning on my own. That's that's a very good tip. I need I've started doing some of that too, of just stepping away from it all. And it's hard to do. Yeah. Especially in the current situation of everything that's going on in our country and in the world today. I mean, it's always an issue. There's always something that's in the history that's good going on, but it seems it's a lot worse at the moment, yes. Now. Yeah. And it's easy to be distracted, yes. Yeah. I actually also started doing a SWOT analysis on that too. Yeah. Because I started worrying about random things that I saw in headlines. And then I started asking myself, is there something that I can actively do to help in this situation using the skills that I currently have? Mm -hmm. And if there isn't anything, 
then I shift on to the next problem. It's okay. Because it's not all your responsibility. Always something you can do about everything. Yeah. And if I get mired down by other things, then I never accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, it took a really long time to not feel guilty about doing nothing. Mm -hmm. If that may, if that makes sense. <laughs> but eventually I, I kind of learned how to do that and I'm helping in some way, but you can't help in every way. Mm -hmm. And then, so the last one on here is so every time I would read an article that I would think would be remotely interesting or remotely helpful, now we're in the future, I would start bookmarking it on my browser and I would start organizing it by category. And so then I would have an adult learning folder and I would have a JavaScript folder, a human computer interaction folder, and the list goes on, and like a service learning folder. And then I would start building subfolders within those and start categorizing resources that I could refer back to later. And this would mean that instead of reading something that was vaguely interesting, then going back a year later and saying, I kind of sort of remember this thing that was sort of really helpful and it would probably come in handy right now, but what in the world was it called and who wrote it? And now I just check my bookmarks. All right, and I'm picking on JavaScript because it's actually the most common question that I get is how do I learn how to do coding? And so this is more or less how I broke that skill down because I think this is actually the most common question that I get. But so we'll go back and say my goal is to learn JavaScript to build an interactive learning experience rooted in adult learning theory. And so right now, what people are trying to do in schools and just on their own, they start learning JavaScript and then they want to practice it. So they start going online and saying, are there some sample problems that I can use to start learning this? So they've already learned the basics, but they never had a goal. And they don't know what kind of job they're going to get and they don't know how, so they start going online asking for problem sets. They get problem sets and start practicing them, but it's just practicing. And it's there's no context to it. So you can't say, I learned JavaScript, I shook off the newness, now I'm doing these specific problem sets to accomplish this goal. That last step is missing. And again, I think that's probably why 67% of people give up. But how can we as self-directed learners or we as instructors or, or teachers or facilitators help people bridge that gap? And ideally before they start learning JavaScript, because what if their goal doesn't require JavaScript? What if it needs Python? And then they've just spent all that time. And I sort of talked about this already, but I put this slide in just because sometimes this is the only reason people attended the session. So again, I learned the basic skills and learned the terminology. And then I directly tied in those relevant practice problems with my goal. And even setting up a fake goal can help a lot. And in this case, I would actually also add the step of mapping out the potential jobs that are in the local area and practice solving local problems using the tool that you learned. Because the purpose of businesses and the community is to help pe meet people's needs. And right now there's a service learning aspect that's being pushed for companies and organizations. So any new incoming employee that can add value to the company by saying, I know how to use JavaScript in this framework to be able to solve relevant problems in the community. And if I can help you do this, then people will view the business better. And this is why I'm an asset to your company. 
So I didn't add that on there. It's kind of a long one, but it's an option. And then you get increased self-motivation and reduced transfer issues. And one thing that I'll add is that right now, uh, they also did a common sense media survey that asked high school students what they wanted to be able to do in their future career. And the high school students said that they wanted to do something that would help people. But then they look at some of the resources for learning how to code. How does learning how to code help people? And how does that tie into your interest and skills? SWOT analysis. So essentially, this learning process is helping us do this. Uh, Noel Birch, he worked in human resources, and don't quote me on the year, but it was, I'm not even going to say it, but he built the Conscious Competence Ladder. And this is kind of the series of skills that, like the series of stages that people generally go through to go from I know absolutely nothing to I kind of, I've learned what this skill is, I've identified why I need to learn the skill, but I still don't really know a ton. And then you finally move into, okay, so I learned the basics, I shook off the newness, I know the terminology, but whenever I do my practice problems, it still takes a really long time to do. And then finally, this is where you're starting to reach the expert level and you've practiced it, the skill is automatic. But in a lot of different frameworks, you're kind of encouraged to get a mentor, someone who will walk you through these stages. But if everyone on the internet who was trying to learn a new skill was required to get a mentor, how would that shake out? Do we have enough expert level mentors that would be able to help the average learner work their way up through this skill level? I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not. But those experts, they also put all of their guidance and articles online. So one of the major things that I had to teach myself is I've been trained to believe that I need a mentor who will walk me through every single one of these steps. But the thing is, even when I actually went to a professional development seminar or something like that, and I heard an expert speak in person, this was labeled professional development and it was labeled some form of mentorship. How much one-on-one -on -one interaction do you get with an expert in that situation? You might get a five to 15 minute Q&A in the background and you might be able to ask one question. What is the difference between that and watching that same expert speak on YouTube? You get the same information, you process it through your own past experiences in the same way, and you have to, you're talking to your local community to find out how they process the information and how your local community reacts to the information is sometimes more important than what the expert has to say because you can't control what your how your local community is going to react to a new technology or a new process or a new concept and that expert isn't going to be around to help you through that process so it kind of made me rethink the role of mentorship unless it's a local mentor But it was interesting. Okay, it's 1042. I'm just checking my time. So this hey, was the other thing. Oh, sorry. I just want to remind people while you're on here, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts and suggestions about what uh, Man has been talking about, go ahead and type in your question section and um, we can gather them and answer any questions, have any discussion you guys want to have. And I'll also open this just in case a chat pops in. Mm -hmm. But 
so another thing that kind of came up for me is so right now when we're trying to seek out information online when we're in so i'll start this a different way when i was in my undergrad when i was in high school and just in general in life i was taught to go through the fight the feynman principle the feynman principle is when you want to learn something deeply you learn it by teaching others so now when i was when my cousin was in high school she was told to express herself through websites and this is awesome but now i find myself learning from information online and recognizing that everyone online is at a different stage of learning because most people are online to do some version of the Feynman principle. And then I had to teach myself how to look at these different resources, compare them against others, and try to figure out who was at which stage in this process. Because everyone is at some various different stage, but I want to learn from people that it's in stage four, maybe stage three. And most people are trying to pass them off as being in a higher stage than they actually are. So when I learned, how do you know that? Anyone can say anything in their about page. When you learn how to learn, you don't learn from me, you learn from him. So, it's kind of information processing and finding a good information resource. And this is something librarians are kind of awesome at, but this is kind of another element to it, which is we're already looking at how people are funded, but are we looking at whether this person shares my values? The people we learn from, what we read and what we experience shapes who we are as a person, but do we know the values of the people that we're learning from online? We might know the values of the people that we're learning from in person, but, and especially in the world of technology where you might go from learning absolutely, knowing absolutely nothing to learning a bunch of stuff, does that technologist share your values or do you just know which projects they worked on and succeeded with before? And even if they make a whole ton of money and have been su successful on paper, are they going to guide your ethics properly? Do they believe in what you believe? And are they trying to accomplish the same thing you're accomplishing? Do they want to help the world too? Or are they just really good at what they do? This was actually one of the hardest things to figure out. And this is something that I have to do a check for every time I add a new resource. So this brings me to, this is a really helpful step to reach out to professional learning communities or people who have been there and done that before. But then you go back to this. The people who are going to shape you and who are going to shape your learning path, you want to make sure that they're actually out for something good. And if you're going to reach out to a professional learning community that is requesting money to help, that's not always bad, but are you paying for something that's decent? And just kind of in general, in this whole process, frustration happens a lot. It's just a thing. And that's where I had to figure out the motivation series. So this is actually one thing that I'll ask you right now. And if you could go into the chat, what keeps you motivated? Mm. Depends, motivated about what? <laughs> Just in general? 
just in general, what makes you look at life and say, you know, this is going to turn out okay. And say, I'm going to try to do lifelong learning and I need to build these new skills to succeed in a rapidly changing world. What is going to keep me going? Mm -hmm. Is it friends? Is it family? Is it being able to contribute to something greater than myself? And what keeps you going? Good question. All right. Yeah, go ahead and type into your question section. I got a few um, comments coming in. Uh, aiming for my goals and making it fun. Nice. Like, making learning fun, I think, yeah, it can, can help. It's like you said earlier, Amanda, help teaching someone else, which depending on your point of view can be fun or not, but yeah. um, um, definitely. And then uh, support rec recognition, the fun of learning. Once again, fun, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have any ideas about what motivates you? This may be something hard to think of. I was trying to think about what, why I do what I do. And I think it goes back to that, the Japanese thing you had there of all those things that can come together to hopefully make things good. And I try to have those things that I, I for the last 20 years-ish, I'm outing myself here, here at the commission, um, a lot of my learning and educating and what I do is helping librarians do their jobs it's like a trickle down is what i always think about and what keeps me motivated that if um it gets down to the end of the um individual person in the community eventually what i do and i like I, that you know um making a difference to that individual that's it the making a difference in that at the end of of everything uh, let's see here. Wanting to rekindle sense of wonder and excitement at learning new things that I had as a child. Oh, I like that one. Yes, as a child, everything was new. And now I think we tend to think, eh, I know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't. There's <laughs> um, another one. Trying to learn new stuff to help keep up with my grandsons and, help, and to help other people. Yes, keeping up with. Yeah. Seeing the passion and excitement, especially by youth. Oh, that's true. <laughs> we teach them something that we think we know, and it's like no big deal. But to them, as the, just I'm a previous person, think of the um, you know ex excitement of learning as a child. To them, it's the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has anyone tried using stories and reading to identify people's values? To see how they respond to them or what what they yeah. say about the different stories yeah because it's kind of like you read a book and you say this this character is like awesome i want to be more like this person yeah has anyone read the book and then said well what about this person do you want to be more like and what do you like about their values and what makes them them mm -hmm. and how does this fit in your own life that's a good way to try and think about it if you can't just come up with something, yeah. Yeah, because oh, yeah, a couple of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you said there were a couple other ones? Yeah, um, the desire to want to learn or, or know more. Yeah. More, yeah, that whole general, yeah. And feeding my and others' creativity. Yeah. The creative way, but yeah. It's like, I just want to learn all the things. Is that so wrong? And so how, if anyone feels comfortable, what are your values? What drives you to do the things that you do and shapes the decisions that you make? And has anyone ever asked you this before? Oh, we do have a comment about the reading and identifying with someone in a book, someone, uh, which is great. Someone said, I hadn't thought about that before, but will in the future. Nice. That's a good way to do things, yeah. So the, what was the new question? <laughs> I was reading oh, that. so what are your values? And what are, so if you could think of any set of maybe a few words that describes who you are and what drives your decisions. And I'll actually, I'll grab this. 
mine tools. Oh, let's see. Okay, here. Can everyone see a list of words on the screen right now? Mm -hmm. Kind of small, but I can read them if I <laughs> look in, yeah. <laughs> there you go, that's good, yeah. So this was the list of values that were kind of options. Hmm. And I couldn't fit all of them on the screen. But if you could just say maybe one of them in the chats that say, this is who I am and this is what drives me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, so the first comment, the kind of comment came, that came through is actually exactly what I was thinking. And I was kind of, I don't know if it's embarrassed or not, but no one ever asked about my values. And that's a deep thought question. I agree. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, I don't know what are my, I just do things. And I never sat down to think about why. I think it's just, it's the right thing to do sometimes is what I, why I do things. It's the helpful thing to do. Um, but if the fact of what I do being values, like this person, no one ever asked really. And no one ever asked me either. And yeah. it was kind of like the world kind of became clearer when I started filtering all my decisions through this. I think you can sit down, like she said, the deep thought question. And you might, if you don't know right now, like me, that's fine. But it may be something to think about and figure out what are the most important things to me. Um, but we do have some people that did men do mention things. Uh, one person says compassion, that mm -hmm. uncovered everything. Another one that person says family orientedness and faith. I'm trying to I always, like I said, I just think in general, I just try to be open and try and do the right thing to as well yeah. as I can to help people. I don't know. I have to think more about it. And some might maybe look into some more of these things about what what are values that you can have. Would it be helpful to for me to set up like a values exercise to do in the library? Do you think people would do it? I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> This is something to uh, expand upon, yeah. Because I started a template for like a workshop template for how values shape the technology we choose. Oh, mm -hmm. and I think I've gotten feedback that it could be interesting, but would people actually use it? So I wonder if some of the values. Oh well, someone says yes, definitely. <laughs> um, and I think it's something also we might, it's unconscious. Yeah. Somewhere you've got these values. You may never have um, articulated them or, or put a word to them like this. And you are using them in some way when you're choosing, maybe you're choosing what technology to have at your library, choosing what to teach, choosing how to teach it, choosing who to teach it to, all of those things. But yeah. have you ever thought about it as that, as the basis? Yeah. Um, and we now have some more people talking about what their values are too. Um, service, being helpful to our patrons while being approachable. And uh, courtesy, respect for others. Mm -hmm. And another person saying, yes, that's a good idea having something of values to technology type workshop, workshop or session, yeah. I think it's definitely something that's hard to think about as the it first really is. thought question. If you've never thought about it before and if no one's ever asked you, you've never had to think about it. So yeah. what do I, what do I think? <laughs> and I might need someone to guide me through the process of figuring out what are my values. I know what I do. I think I know why I do them. A lot of it's instinct, habit, unconscious, whatever. Um, and it was actually a series of books and movies that helped me figure out what my values were. Because mm -hmm. I'm the same way. No one had ever asked me. Yeah. 
and it was um, Find Me Unafraid and The Alchemist that helped most recently. And let me close this and I'll skip this, but this is just what we need. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's, it's gonna take a while but we'll get there it's gonna happen mm -hmm. and let me check so we're at 10 58 and do we have any questions yeah. if anybody has any other any questions you want to ask or uh, thoughts you want to share about um, about this how um, you've been using online learning how it's affected you what you've been doing with it or any ideas for how people could use it to do all these things that a management talk and get it typed into the question section there um oh and i will also put the link to these slides in here mm -hmm. just in case you wanted to take a gander so yep, we'll sure. link to them uh, to the in the uh, when I get the archives up as well, which should be by the end of the week at the latest. And everyone who attended today and everyone who registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the archive is ready and when it's up on our website, so you'll know. Um, it has to be uh, processed by GoToWebinar and updated to um, uploaded to YouTube. You know, did that go? It says that I went to organizers and panelists, and I couldn't actually see any of the chats that went through. I only heard what you read. So I wonder if this link actually got to you. Um, it got to me. I saw it here. Um, here, let me, um, I'm going to resend it to the entire audience to see if that gets you through. Um, uh, someone says they did see it. Yep, yep. So it's there. Yeah, uh, okay. but it will also be linked to in the archives as well. Like I said, um, we do have some comments. Uh, Amanda, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Great food for thought. And <laughs> okay, I'll read this one. It's a little embarrassing. Thank you, Amanda. You are a treasure to our profession. And thank you, Krista. What a tremendous resource you are providing. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're happy to do it. Um, Encompass Live is our as a, it's our weekly webinar show, and um, we've been doing it for a long time, and we're going to keep doing it uh, as long as we have people who want to talk about things. All right. <laughs> it does keep coming up, yeah. And so as a thanks, I really like that I can review the presentations. Yes, we always try to put up the archive of the recording, um, and if there are any slides or um, uh, handouts or documents or anything that come along with them yeah <laughs> keep up the good work yeah we, we will <laughs> all right i think i'm gonna if anyone has any questions about to amanda let us know I type in i'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen just for the moment here oh, yeah. while we're doing this there we go yeah um, so yeah, type, type, type in your questions if you do have any right now, anything urgent, desperate you want to ask her about. Otherwise, her email is on the end of that slide presentation there, so you can always contact her on there. Um, and like I said, the recording will be available, the slides will be available, and you'll all be notified when they are ready. Uh, again, just lots of thanks coming in right now, Amanda. Thanks, I really enjoyed it. Probably like, like the first person said, a lot of food for thought. I think a lot of people are going to be... Um, musing on this afterwards, <laughs> which is great, which is what I was hoping for um, uh, with this presentation. So uh, that was uh, this month's Pretty Sweet Check from Amanda. And it will be, as I mentioned, on our Encompass Live website. Um, our upcoming shows are listed here. You'll notice I've got some in J uh, July ones scheduled here. Yes, you don't see anything for next week or the week after yet. I'm working on some finalizing some things there, so keep an eye on our schedule on our website here for when I announce when the shows are, are uh, confirmed. Um, this is where the archives are. This is our archives. The most recent ones go at the top of the page, so today's will be up here. I have a link to the recording and a link to the slide presentation. Um, you can also search our archives as another presenter, as, as another attendee mentioned, being able to review the presentation. We have a search feature here, and you can also limit it just the most recent 12 months if you want to. That is because this is our full Encompass Live archives, and I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom, but 
and Compass Life premiered in January 2009, and we have all of our archives here going back to the very beginning. So do pay attention if you search the entire archives to just the, pub, the uh, broadcast date, the original broadcast date of when a particular show was done. Some of our topics and things will stand the test of time, readings, um, lists, things like that. Um, but sometimes some things will be um, outdated. Uh, there may be some links that don't work, some services or resources that don't exist anymore or who have changed since we did the original show. Um, but we will uh, keep all of our archives here. We'll always keep them on this page, even if they do become outdated. We, um, but with that um, original broadcast date, you'll know when exactly the information is from. Um, we are librarians. This is what we do. One of the things we do, archive things, and we will keep doing that. So our full archives will always be here for you to go back and look at. Um, we also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you are if you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We put reminders. Here's your reminder to log into this morning's show, announcements about our presenters and when shows are um, being, uh, what shows are coming up, when recordings are available, uh, things like that. So uh, keep an eye on, um, give us a like over on Facebook if you do like to do that. Let me pop back here to our main page. There we go. All right, so then that does wrap it up for today's show. Thank you everyone for attending um, with us this morning. Thank you, Amanda, for being here and tell, teach, helping us learn about how to leverage our online learning that a lot of us have been doing possibly more than usual. Right. <laughs> uh, so I think this is very good, very timely. And like I said, she does do these sessions every month and you can see her for the end of next month will be on July 29th, topic to be determined. I'm sure she's got, you've got something cooking up. <laughs> I have a couple in the hopper. All right, yeah, so keep an eye on that of what topic she comes up with for next month. Other than that, thank you very much for being with us today, and we'll see you uh, another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>